Hi, Jay. Thank you for joining us today. Pleasure um, to you. We're going to talk about team dynamics and the masterclass. And by masterclass, we actually mean the next level up masterclass, not the same old boring team dynamics that everyone else talks about. It's, uh, as it were, the, the team and beyond. Yes, and absolutely. How to get to the heart. So first of all, just tell us a little bit about you and why team dynamics are important the next stage. Well, really, it started about 25 years ago. Um, I joined the British Army. Um, it was never an intent um, to join as a soldier. Um, I, I believed that if I stayed at school for long enough, that by the time I finished, I would know what to do. Um, and I got to 18 and didn't, so I, I went to university um, and studied at university for three years and still didn't really know what to do. Um, however, all my friends had joined the Army and without any real direction, figured that it wasn't such a bad thing to go and join all my mates. I'll do three years, I'll find myself, um, and then I'll come <laughs> back to uh, to my degree in the safety of the UK. What I didn't realise is that the Army has a fabulous opportunity of um, psychometric testing as, as part of your onboarding process, and they'd already established that I was going to be a career soldier for way before I even knew that I was going to be a soldier at all, really. Oh, wow. um, so we went through this went through this basic training, um, there's a lovely quote, um, breaketh the boy to maketh the man. Um, um, but but within it, you, you learn to cease to be an individual and your part within a bigger team. Um, I, I, I absorbed that well. Um, and over the next 12 and a half, 13 years made that my absolute career. It was going to be it was going to be a lifelong career. I loved every second of every day that I spent in the army. Um, and it was great to be able to work in such massive teams and yet to see them all work so effectively and, and productively. So when my career was brought to a significant um, earlier close than I expected, I was medically discharged after an accident in the second Gulf in oh. 2002. All of a sudden it was a case of all my eggs in my basket and someone's burnt my basket. Um, there's nothing, nothing left to do. Well, I certainly didn't want to go back to the education that I chose when I was at university, as mm -hmm. so few of us ever do. Um, <clears throat> but I found that being able to utilise the same skills that we, we adopted within the army that worked so well on the battlefield have, have proven so effective for me in the businesses that I now uh, work within. OK, because you are actually quite an accomplished entrepreneur where you actually have four successful businesses. Um, I am. Um, I, over the last 10 years, um, I cheated and I take my hat off to anybody that set out on day one, um, either gave up a full time job or, or left um, and, and decided to be able to set up their own business. Uh, I, I must admit, my first business, I was an absolute cheat. Um, having, having received a medical pension from the British Army um, and a golden handshake, as it were, for, for my time and service. Um, I cheated by buying an existing business. Uh, I figured that I had this pot of money that I didn't really know exactly what to do with. And I knew that if I didn't do something sensible with it, I was going to do something most unsensible with it. <laughs> so so invested it in, bought a, an existing business of some 14 years and three staff. Um, what I quickly learned from buying the business, I was told that I was buying the business because the, the founder of the business had sadly taken ill health and was looking to be able to sell and retire and, and enjoy his last few years. What quickly transpired is the fact that He'd, he'd not run the finances in the business that well. Um, and it was in distinct need of a cash injection in order for it to operate at all. Mm -hmm. um, but again, having no very real, no, not much real experience in business, but in much experience in being able to, the grit and determination to make a project work, which is what we did for 12 years in the army. Mm -hmm. um, figured that if I'm going to put some money in, and I put a quite a significant chunk of my own money in, that I needed to be able to get a return on investment of this. So I needed to be able to find out what was broken, to be able to get the right team on board to be able to make it work, and then to see as to how effective it could be and how it worked. Um, and thankfully, over over the next 11 months, we took the staff team from 3 to 11. Um, we went over the next 11 months from 11 to 22. Um, and at 22 staff, I got a bit bored. Um, <laughs> We'd set all these processes and systems up and we got a team in that were really, were really working well. But but I realised that, 
that perhaps it didn't need me at the helm any longer. It, it had got to the stage where I'd ceased to get the excitement out of what was coming next because we'd already planned and we already knew what was coming. Mm -hmm. um, so over the, the next two years, um, I, I either sat up with a colleague um, or bought or acquired um, two or three other businesses, um, three of which I've, I've subsequently kept um, either as a minority shareholder or as a joint, joint partnership. Um, and two others that have either sold or, or passed on. Um, yeah. But it seems to have been the, the same dynamic throughout all of them. And it, it, we haven't bought businesses in the same in the same field or sector. I've got two businesses that are online and two that are offline, two that are service, two that are product. Um, we, we've seen the whole range of different things that we could do. And yet applying the same lessons, we've been able to see the same results. So you've I've got a basic winning formula then, really? It would appear so. Um, <laughs> Um, I keep counting my blessings and saying, you know, I wonder, wonder when it's going to end, but so far it hasn't as of yet. Okay, well, so from your first business of 11 people, admittedly it was one that was already going, but that's not always easy to take up another man's reins and carry on. So to have 11 people and grow it to 22, you must have spotted how to build a winning team? Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, well, so when I when I took on the original team, um, there was there was a bit of resistance with regards to well, one I was a lot younger than the other three people that worked in the business. The other three had been in the business for 11, 14, and seventeen years prior to it being made available for sale, um, and it was a case of who's this young upstart that's tipped up with some <laughs> cash in his pocket and seems to think that um, seems to think that he knows what's to do. Um, and yet, you know, I brought three staff on very quickly after I took the business on. I brought three staff on within about five weeks of taking the business over um, and created this. There's a lovely saying, isn't there? Forming, norming, storming, performing. Um, form a new team. Allow it the storms to settle. Allow it to, to get to calmer waters. Mm -hmm. And then only then will it actually truly start to perform again. Now, you know, there's a lovely there's a lovely thought within the military that you can push people through the FSN and get them straight to P, get them straight to perform on day one. But as a business owner, you've got to appreciate and acknowledge that the moment you take the foot off the gas, it does have to go back to the FSN model. It does have to go through that storming period. And even if you need people to perform on day one, as a business owner, you've got to accept the fact that at some stage, when you take the foot off the gas, when the pressure isn't on, that they will go back to this formation stage. It'll go through some storming period, and you might, in those periods, need to be able to uh, manage people rather well and closely. And it's only once it starts to settle again that the new team will perform. Right. So it's interesting you're talking about the stages, because I guess we see that on television shows like The Apprentice. Because I guess that's the classic what you're talking about, that the team is asked to perform straight away. And then we're actually watching that storm Absolutely. unfold week on week, as it were. Quite ironically, you know, I mean, the, the apprentice model has now gone from just the UK to uh, to several other countries. And yet it doesn't matter as to what type of person you attract in order to understand that, you know, there are 18 people mm -hmm. at the start of the process and they will be only one at the end of it. And understanding that every week the dynamic within the team changes and yet the objective and the mission stays the same you've got to understand that the performance has to be first rate and yet behind the scenes there will always be that that storming process in order to try and find the right dynamics for the right team okay well then that brings me nicely on to that so how does uh team our team dynamics or those team dynamics differ from uh the americans and why is it so, so important hmm. um if I look back to my military career, um, and I'm going to take the, the first Gulf War as a really good example. Um, just prior to the political decision for, um, for for foreign forces to be able to storm Iraq and be able to uh, take out Saddam and, and, and you know remove the regime that was and replace it with something that's far more hospitable, there were 258,000 American soldiers formed up on its borders. Um, and about 72 hours prior to the political decisions to go in, um, there was this decision that it was going to be spearheaded by 8,200 British soldiers. Wow. Um, and the difference between the American model and the British model is 
we simply don't have the might. We don't have the amount of people. We don't have the amount of resource. We don't have the amount of equipment or of ability that the Americans can replicate again and again and again and again and again. And the only way that we can continue to be considered as one of the most professional fighting forces in the world is by understanding the dynamics of its people in order to get everyone to perform at such a high level that you can compete on the international field. Now, how that compares to British business is there are many, many, many businesses that still operate in, in what I consider a quite a linear fashion. You'll get one chief exec or founder at the very top of an organization, and then there'll be an executive board of maybe 12 or 15 people that'll sit there and, and make some policy decisions. There might be a non-exec board, depending on the size of business that they're in, and then there's some general managers and field managers, and it works it all the way down. The, the guy at the bottom doesn't seem to know one way or another as to what he's doing and how that relates to the business plan, um, and yet is expected to perform on a day-to-day -day basis in front of a client. Mm -hmm. uh, the two examples I give is uh, I've spent a, I spent a number of time a while ago now as um, working with the non-exec board at Morrison's, the uh, the international uh, or the national supermarket chain, and it was interesting because one of my roles was to be able to work with general managers in stores. Um, and yet you used to speak to anybody below like general manager, area general manager, and ask them as to how what they were doing in their store and how it related to the five or six or seven, or in Ken Morrison's um, case before Ken retired, a 13-year business plan. Um, wow. and, and people just didn't seem to understand as to what they did and how it correlated with, with the overall business plan. Now, Compare that to about six months, seven months after I left Morrison's and I worked with Marks and Spencer for, um, for a few months in almost the same role but for a different supermarket chain. Mm -hmm. And you saw completely the different, different uh, completely the reverse. You could speak to a part-time weekend cashier. Um, not that there's anything wrong with part-time weekend cashiers, I might add. But you, might, you could speak to anybody in the business and they understood quite sincerely and, and quite with some... some some passion about them as to what they did and, and how that related to the to the bigger business proposal. And if I compare that to the military perspective and then to corporate business, you tend to find that the, the American model is very much a case of there are lots of generals that sit and d discuss on the hill and whether it's politically correct or not politically correct and the outfall for them and their senators. Um, meanwhile, you've got lots of you know, generals in the in the field that are out there just to be able to get the next OBE or whatever the American equivalent is, um, all the way down to the field soldier that is just following orders. Uh, and I've got some lovely examples of, of, of how that happened firsthand compared to the British model, where we just don't have that structure in, available to us. We don't have the mass of, <clears throat> of senior managements to be able to afford that type of management structure. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we've, we've done completely the opposite. We will have one person at the top that's responsible to number 10 and the crown um, who will feed down to a number of field officers who will simply turn around to field soldiers like myself. I left as a staff sergeant before I finished. So I had a team of about somewhere between 70 and 100 people used to work for me on a day-to-day on a, on a -day basis. And simply, we will be told what the mission is. We would never be instructed with regards to how we're going to carry it out. We were just told as to what the mission was and what we needed to achieve. And it was down to us to establish as to what needed to be done in order to get the missions to completion. Right. Now, how that relates to British business or how that relates to business in, in, in large is we've got to take away this ownership of business. We've got to take away this, this real... This real arrogance about business owners that believe that we know best um, and be willing to pass as much responsibility down the chain as possible, giving them some parameters to which they have to work, but getting them to buy into the vision of the business and understand as to what it is we're aiming to achieve, and then allowing everyone within our business to come to the fore and say, so what have you got to, to, to deliver to allow them to be able to come on board? But I think that's the thing with the, a lot of British businesses is that um, there seems to be this where we can't tell everybody what's going on. But I do know that 
Marks and Spencers seem to have a bit more of a communication structure in their system because I remember, oh, certain, certainly 20, 30 years ago, most retailers were trying to poach the Marks and Spencer staff because they were one of the best trained at the time. Absolutely. And, and it was because of this sharing of information that everyone felt at ease of the brand, what they were doing, how and what they were contributing. It was interesting. I did the uh, the Disney management training experience um, a couple of years ago. Um, not not the whole full thing. I'd I'd love to go back and do the rest of it. But there were segments of it that we were able to be able to go and take part in. Um, and it was fascinating to see that um, the the whole structure w was about n no one had a real job description as such. Um, they'd all signed into a an ethical code of behaviour, um, and it was about understanding that we have a joint responsibility to match a certain behavioural pattern as opposed to saying, but that's not my job. Um, it was quite interesting to be able to see as to how it differed from perhaps the more traditional model. And yet you've only got to look at Disney's to understand, you know, it is the most successful small business in the world to, to, to understand that they've got to have something right. Um, I certainly know in my first business um, that, that's now got, I mean, it's quite ironic. Um, I'll tell you a very quick story for me. Um <laughs> I remember going to listen to Tony Robbins a number of years ago now uh, and being fascinated by by the guy on stage. And there was something that really resonated with him. It, it was the 26th of October a few years ago now, about 10, maybe 11 years ago now. Um, and it was the 26th of October. And, and he said, the only true way to be able to determine as to whether your business is successful is if it can actually make you redundant be, 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 and not even realise that, that you've gone. Um, have you so automated your process by owning the business that it doesn't need you as part of it any longer? Well, at the time I got 22 staff, um, I thought that the business was doing exceptionally well for itself. There was a project that I wanted to get involved with the following year, which involved buying <clears throat> or buying some shares in a different business and spending some time with it. And I thought, I'm, I'm going to put this to the test. So I went back to the team in the January straight after New Year and said, something's come up. I'm going to get involved in a new project this year. This was back in 2006. Um, I'm going to get involved in a new project this year. And for the first few weeks of this year, I'm unlikely to be around for a while. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to be able to make sure that you, you get the job done. You know what the mission is for this year. Um, we've all signed up to be able to be part of that mission for, for the next 12 months or so. And give me a ring when you need me. Um, and with that, I parted for the hills to go and meet up with a guy called Alan so we could set up a new business together. And and quite ironically, I, I got involved with that business quite quickly. There was a lot of things happening. There was a lot of things that we could we could do together. There was there was a great resonance between the two of us. And, and we went off and we did some great stuff together. And it was in the July. I was on holiday with my wife in, uh, in Portugal in the Algarve. And we'd been away for about 10 days. We got a two-week break. And it was day 11, and I remember it so specifically. I was sat by the pool and was reading one of my books. And she just leaned across and she said, when was the last time that you went into the office? And I thought for a minute, and I thought, January? Crikey. You see, they'd never phoned. <laughs> but then that's coming back down to picking your team correctly. For example, being able to find the right people, putting the right team together and having that dynamics is right and, and together is key because I know another business owner, famously enough, Richard Elner, who had Red Letter Days. It was a multi-million pound company. She did exactly what you um, said. Um, she hired a team, left it so she could go and do other projects. But in her case, she'd picked the wrong people because it all collapsed behind her. So is there a way to actually know that you're getting the right people and the right dynamics are actually going on? Brilliant. <laughs> um, there is. Um, you see, the beauty of having been a medic in the army is the fact that we made life and death decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we often made life and death decisions sometimes on a minute-by-minute -minute basis and often under the most extreme of circumstances. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have been able to say that from the day I joined the army back in 92 to the day I was medically discharged in 2004, that there's never been a British soldier serve anywhere in the world in conflict without me having served in the same conflict at his side. Um, I volunteered for four of my 
seven tours in order to go away and work with the team that I had such an, a strong affinity to. I knew that if they were going, I wanted to be with them because that's the type of team that we created. Um, the simple answer is it's about getting to know your people and hiring on attitude and not on qualification or skill. Now, I'm sick to death of receiving CVs that tell me I've got a degree in this and I've got 20 years experience in the other. Um, and quite frankly, it, it doesn't really impress me that much. Um, mm. I like to listen to people who are getting what it is that we're trying to achieve and wants to be part of that for the future. So my last business, My True North, um, we formed it on the 27th of March this year. Um, we hadn't been going that long. We'd, we'd had a, a soft launch on the 26th of March this year. And, and day one of this business with one employee, me, um, was on the 27th of March. Um, and yet on the 14th of April, I received an email from somebody who I'd never met before, um, who followed somebody that I followed, but we weren't connected directly from somewhere else in the country that said, having seen what you've done and seen the launch, we'd, we were quite particular about getting our launch out there as much as possible on social media um, to let people know that we existed and that we were around. But she approached me and she said, I love the ethos. I love the methodology. I, I love what you're talking about. The philosophy about what you're talking about resonates with me so much that I want to know as to when you're going to be in a position to be able to take me on so I can give up my full-time job and come and work for you. Oh, wow. Now, I said I'm fascinated by that type of approach. Um, I didn't really ask where she was from at the time. I just said that would be great. Um, perhaps we could have a coffee and, and a chat to determine as to this, this resonance that you talk about. Um, with views to being able to do something later this year, maybe. Um, I said, how are you fix for tomorrow? And she said, fine, not a problem. Tell me where. Um, we agreed to meet in a local hotel um, at nine o'clock the following morning. Um, she was there about three or four minutes before I arrived, having driven three hours um, to be at that meeting. Wow. Um, she'd taken a day off work. She'd got her parents to be able to provide childcare for her. And she'd driven three hours to meet me at nine o'clock in the morning for a coffee because she bought into the philosophy. And ironically, two weeks later, she was handing a notice in and she's now my accounts manager. <laughs> so it's coming back to the behaviour rather. But then you see, I, I agree with you, but the biggest problem is getting through HR teams. Hmm. Um, <laughs> and I have been told, uh, what was it? I was talking to um, Professor Steve uh, Windmill, who was the former COO of the British Army. And I was having a chat with him once, and I was actually disagreeing with him. And that man, you don't people. disagree, as you do, <laughs> but I do. And uh, it was interesting because he turned around and he said, "You know, where was you when I'm in when I was in that job? Because I needed someone like you to pull me up every now and then." And he said, "I would have hired you on the spot." Hmm. I went, "Yes, but unfortunately, your HR team would not let somebody through like me because I don't have the right qualifications." Hmm. And the fact that I have a skill of being able to say, oi, and discuss, and actual fact, I'm just, uh, I I'm too naive about where this kind of glass ceiling is that you're not supposed to talk to people of, uh, and you're supposed to be a yes man cuts in, you know. And um, you, there are people like us who are needed, who are wanted, but we cannot get through. So what other advice do you have for business owners? Because there are business owners who don't like giving information away, but they do want that team but they also want to find the right people who are going to help them prepare their information the best way for the rest of the business so that the right key information gets through. Okay, there's there's two key points there. If we can address them separately, if that's all right. Yep. Um, first of all, there will always be a gatekeeper, and it doesn't matter as to how small a business or how big a business you're in, there will always be a gatekeeper to, to the decision maker. And we need to understand that the person that we're talking to might be the decision maker or might be the gatekeeper or might be an influencer of either. Now, because of social media, there is always, always the opportunities to be able to get the right conversation with the right people if you're prepared to work and do something a little bit quirky, a little bit different. So 
let me give you a quick example. One of the conversations I've had recently was with the um, chief information officer of a large multi-corporate. Um, I was commissioned by one of our clients who desperately wants to try and work with them, but try and try and try and try as they much as they can to try and get through the front door. They aren't considered big enough in order to be able to get past all of the red tape to get to speak to the right person. Yes. Um, however, we understood that the chief information officer, the person that's going to be the decision maker on this process, is a Tottenham fan. Um, <laughs> okay. You know, at, at the end of the day, it's not my fault that he's a Tottenham fan, um, but he happens to be a Tottenham fan. Um, so being able to send in a complimentary ticket to come and join us in our box for him and a friend or so, so he didn't have to have the spend of doing it himself. So we could pick him up in a nice car and send him on his way. He probably could afford to buy Tottenham with the job that he's in. Um, but the simple answer is that someone was willing to be able to invest in buying some time meant that we were able to not only meet with the person in question, but have the right conversation with them because we'd built up that emotional bank of goodwill before we'd actually try and cash some of it in. And the beauty of social media is the fact that we've only got to start digging just a little bit further under the surface of the skin to find the right information to be able to start making those contacts. But there is another point here. Um, you know, you talked about how do we do it and how do we get it, get it across there. If, as a business, we want to attract the right people, then we've got to stop doing the same things that we've always done if we've got the people in our team at the moment who aren't the right people to get us to where we want to be. You know the old age old saying about if you always do what you've always done, then you'll always get what you've already got. Yeah. You've got to be willing to do something different if you want to get a different result. So when we launched our business in March this year, we've talked about a set of philosophies, a set of values We've talked about our mission statement. We haven't talked about who we are and what we do in the the, the, the the nitty gritty of the product or the service. We've talked about a style of, of business. We've talked about an ethos. We've got people to be able to buy into what we're about mm -hmm. before they've got un to understand as to how it is that we go about doing it. And if we want to have a different conversation with people, then we need to be willing to have that different conversation internally to be able to ensure that people out there get a different message and see us differently, like us differently, think about us differently in order to be able to get a different result. Okay. So I'm just reading a um, comment by uh, Evangelos. He's uh, fit th hundreds of bricks and mortar business. Most businesses he comes across doesn't have talent um to work in you uh, the talent to work in unison the reason is they um tip small businesses and put teams in place and the self i think what he's trying to say is that uh, small businesses just don't have the right people in the right place for the right time and they're not putting a plan in action to get it all to work together either the big fear for any business owner is to accept that you don't have to be the best at what you do <laughs> um, I was lucky enough to have had a, uh, an audience with Duncan Ballantyne a, one, uh, a few years ago um, and he, he quoted something which I understand is initially the quote of Sir Winston Churchill uh, by simply saying I might not be a smart man but I'm smart enough to surround myself by those who are Oh Richard Branson uses that as well especially uh, when he can't tell the difference between gross profit and net, um, net profit <laughs> There is a significant difference, I might add. Um, but it would be a good idea is to be able to understand the difference between the two. Um, it's, it's not about recruiting people who you feel are looking up to you. It's about being able to look for your mission, look at what you're aiming to achieve, and be willing to find people who are going to get you to what you want to achieve as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. The other thing perhaps we ought to be able to just add to that, which is a bit of a caveat really, is... We need to understand that most of the people that are going to work for this these days are going to be transient. Mm -hmm. um, there is no such thing as a job for life anymore. And anyone that believes that there is ought to go back and put their head back in the sand again. Um, it's got to be about understanding that the team that are with you now have got used to where you are today. Mm -hmm. 
but they may not be the team that are going to get you to where you want to be. In actual fact, they're probably not going to be the whole same team to get you to where you want to be. Because ironically, your idea of success is going to be significantly different to that of somebody else's. Well, that brings me on to a lovely little question, which is, okay, now you've identified somebody who may not be singing off the same hymn sheet, hymn sheet as you, and then not the right person any longer. So um, what's next with those guys? How do you, I, what do you do with them? Do you try and bring them back round? Or because if they were a good team person, can you get them to being back in the team again? Sure. Uh, and again, it's, it's a twofold answer, really. First of all, we've got to understand that our, our mission may change. We may de determine that we're going to take a different path. And we need to be able to educate, help to understand, support, guide. Um, we need to do sufficient to be able to ensure that the people that are with, were with us then are still with us now. Um, so there's an education piece there with regards to this is who I am. This is what we're aiming to achieve. This is what's going to be available to you as part of the team if we get to mission completion and to get buy-in. Um, and it's not about doing the nitty gritty because the nitty gritty will never, ever, ever last forever. Um, it was Stephen Fry that was famously to have said, if you're ever in hell, just keep going. Um, it's <laughs> never going to last forever. Um, so if you're in a bad place, just, just work through it because it's not going to be forever. I think so, that's what people miss about with the team dynamics, isn't it? Absolutely. So it could be a case of, you know, understanding how to be able to support each other and get the best from each other. Getting to know your staff far better than perhaps most of us really do. Again, the beauty of being in the army for so long is the fact that you eat, sleep and breathe together. Um, you are a, a unit. Um, you are such a strong unit that when one goes, you all go together. Um, and it's having that unity, having that buy-in. Um, again, there's another, I know I do cliches with lots of quotes, but Michael Jordan was probably the most famous basketball player of all time, who said it's only when you give up on your own individual goals that you can collectively work as a team to create brilliance. Um, and it's, it's about personal sacrifice and the willingness to be able to make personal sacrifice in order for a whole team to be able to achieve what it is that the group and team have, have agreed, to, to, you know, agreed to take on. However, the caveats to that at the same time is probably summed up best by the book from Jim Collins called From Good to Great, where he talks about understanding that the people on your team now aren't heading in your direction for forever. Um, my ideal of success is perhaps significantly different to your idea of success. And although we both have this idea of success, and we're helping each other to try and achieve it, hopefully by by this call right now. It would be, uh, you know, it would be foolish to to think that my idea in the in of success in the future is going to be exact mirror of what it is that you're trying to achieve. And at some stage in the future, it's about, as Jim Collins says in the book, it's about being being willing to stop the bus and allow some people to get off, not <laughs> kick them off, but but. But, but allow them to get off and perhaps pick up some others along the way that are, that are looking towards how, to, how to get to where they want to be. Um, okay. it, I'll summarise that with, with one other thing, if I may. Um, I constantly have an advert out looking for new stuff, um, although I'm rarely taking on. Um, I'm constantly, I've, got, I've constantly got a foot in the water that's looking for a talent pool because I need to understand that perhaps some of the people in my team now might not be there in the future. So you're thinking with the end in mind of if one goes, then you know where to go for the next. I'm constantly looking, but I'm also looking to determine as to my existing team, how do they compare to what's available on the market at the moment? Uh, you know, if, if, if I get three or four CVs through a week, um, it's, it's pretty much a, a standard typical um, fall, of, fall, you know, fall of CVs at present with regards to people saying, I like the philosophy, um, I'd like to be part of to it. Um, but it gives me the chance to be able to look at the CVs in the pool that's out there and compare that to the pool I've already got in my team to decide as to whether I need to have some conversations internally 
about, hang on a minute, you need to pull your socks up because look what's available. Um, I need to get my, my, my business from here to here in the shortest possible method of doing so. And you're either with me or you're just dead weight. Which brings us nicely on to Amanda's question that she asked earlier. Hello. Um, my question was, how do you um, turn a team around who who aren't working very well together and also have their own agenda? Hmm. What would what would be the best way to do that? Because I, I I work with lots lots of companies and I can see that their team members are just have their own cliques or they're just they they they're not bought into other people, you know, in, in different teams. So how would you recommend that? you would sort of rally them together. Um, is this for you to rally them together in order for them to be able to get them to work with you and accept you as part of this, of this consultancy? In some part? cases, yes. Okay. Um, but, but also to maybe to give advice to, to the business owners that I'm working with. Okay, so again, if it's with regards to yourself, if you're going in and you need people to be able to, to work with you and quickly, and it's all about the rapport building, then it, it's got to be about how you enter the building, how you enter that team, um, and how you're pitched as party of the introduction process. They need to understand that when a new member comes in, their role within the team. You've only got to go back to a junior school uh, playground to understand that you know on, on day one in September, there's that pecking order that we all have to go through um, in order to establish our part within the team. Um, and you need to have clearly identified, or sorry, whoever is bringing you in to that team needs to have clearly communicated your role within it um, and have created some boundaries to which the others can operate that you then need to step into. And if you're coming in as a consultant, then you yeah. need to come in at the toppest, highest level and then, then and to take on that role as opposed to, right, guys, let's all put it together because... Mm -hmm that's incongruent with the role that they've expected you to be in. However, if we're going to try and give some advice to businesses on whole, again, it's a case of get to know your team. Um, get to know your team better than, well, they turned up on time and they've gone home on time and they've not had a sickness absence record, so everything must be okay. Um, my commanding officer, um, I have the utmost in res respect for. I was lucky enough to have served for him for three and a half years. Um, he went on to become Major General, um, the second in command of the Army, um, before he retires in about six or seven weeks' time. And the whole regiment, 800 soldiers, are looking at the moment to be able to descend upon his retirement party to show our respect and regards for him because of the command of respect that he, he demonstrated. And the one single factor that enabled him to be able to command such respect from the people is the fact that he knew them. He knew 818 soldiers by name. He knew if you were married. He knew what your wife's name, if you were married. And if you got kids, he could generally remember whether you got one or two. He got to know his team and he got them to know him. There was such a buy-in of the person that I didn't care whether he said we were going to Canada skiing or back to Afghanistan. We would have followed him because we believed in the person. We understood that there was a mission to complete. And it's got to be about know your people. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. I'll give you All one right. other thought, if I may, Amanda, before oh, you do okay. yeah. <clears throat> The greatest cost or the greatest investment in any business is in its salary bill and its people. Mm. And while ever a business owner sees it as a cost, they will cost him dearly or cost them dearly. As soon as we start to treat our staff as an investment and we invest within them, magic will happen okay cool well, thank you thank, thank you for you. joining us amanda now that brings me on to a lovely kind of question because one of the companies i used to work for he used to talk about always training and investing in people but in actual fact he didn't do it hmm. because he said whenever he did he was just training them up for the next employer brilliant so, <laughs> so for him he never used to train them but what he did do is overpaid them for their job ah so it's he said a, it's an age-old error and it'll always come back to bite 
Well, for him, I could see his logic to a certain degree because those where he, he took them on with lower wages, but he trained them. And instead of paying back with loyalty and then he put his wage, put their wages up, they would just then leave. So he said for him, it was costing his business more because whilst he was investing in the people until they were at the point where they could return on his investment, somebody else was getting that benefit. So what he then did is he took on people, let's say, um, somebody who would typically do a job at £15,000 value, he was paying them twenty or 25. And when I'd say to him, but that's more, um, he'd say, well, if I give them 20 or 25, then they can't leave anywhere because they're, what they're putting in is only 15. But in actual fact, I'm saving myself money because the amount of time and the amount of cost that I'm investing in them to train them up, I'm actually saving by just giving them more higher wages. It's really, really, really short term economics. Um, having worked as training director at a large corporate entity with a £2.4 million budget and 126 training staff to look after, it really, really is short-term dynamics. There was a study done in the Huffington Post about two years ago that was um, off the back of some stuff done by Harvard um, and, um, and one of the other, um, uh, one of the other leading uh, American universities with regards to um, salary. Um, and salary impact with regards to a price increase and price decrease. Now, they didn't just take the model from uh, MST, that was right, um, but they didn't just take the model from America. They then took the model into the Middle East, they took the Middle East into the Southern Hemisphere, they took the Middle East into Europe, and they found it worked collectively in every single sector. And it's simple. If you are paying somebody and the only thing that you are paying them to do is a physical task. Mm -hmm. Pick that up, put it down. Pick that up, put it down. Then the more you pay them, the more efficient, effective and loyal they will become. The moment that you need someone to make a decision or where their intellectual attributes are more important to the business than their physical ability than as, as long as the money was, quote, enough, and I'm not quite sure what enough means, <laughs> it ceased to be the main provider of loyalty to the brand. So I'll give you a quick, a quick personal story um, of um, a family member who will remain nameless for pur purposeful reasons. <clears throat> a family member works in the City of London in a very exec job with a team around him of about 180, 200, with a salary basic of about 180,000 a year and with an expense account of about 30, 35,000. Um, he's worked there from very early on in life. He started off as a probationary guy straight from university and he's worked his way up to become European CEO. And about two years ago, he was approached by an international um, firm from the States that said, we've seen what you've been doing. Um, we've seen your career path to date. We've seen what it is that you've achieved. Um, and we'd like you to now come along and, and work in our international corporate environment as opposed to the European corporate environment that you're used to. And quite frankly, you can write your own ticket. We're happy to be able to make a 50 or £60,000 um, per, per year basic increase. You can have your own share options. You can bring two or three of your own exec team with you. Um, we, we're keen to be able to have you on board. Um, and we understand that you've probably got some gardening leave, forced gardening leave to have. So we'll fund that as well. Um, we'd like to have you on board. When, when do you want to start? Um, and his response was, thanks. If you'd actually been following me that closely, you'd have understood that I've been here for 28 years now. And I'm about three or four years away from retirement. And I've enjoyed working where I am, with who I am. And I've been rewarded sufficiently to do so best of luck in your search for your next employee uh, and, the, and, and the parted ways it was nothing to do with the cash it was to do with the people and the way in which he'd been looked mm -hmm. after now the caveats to this story is 18 months later he's now working for said american company on exactly the same salary that he was on at his previous company yeah because in the 18 months prior to that happening they just simply poached every other member of staff that worked for him who he held in high regard. Uh. 
and they said, if you like working with people, come back and come and work with your people. <laughs> so there's more than one way to actually get the person they wanted. It's never, ever, ever about the money if the money is enough. Right. So it's coming back down to having the right dynamics surrounding you then. Very much so. My, the, my first office manager in my first business, um, a young lady called Sharon, um, and she was on about a pound an hour more than the minimum wage. She did a good enough job. She was okay. She was nothing special. It, it, it was. I inherited it when I bought the business, um, and there was no reasons to get rid of her, um, and that's the way it was. Um, but I said to Sharon at the beginning of, beginning of year one, what do you want us to achieve next year? She says, oh, I don't understand what the question is. I says, well, tell me something. I says, well, if there was anything out there that you could achieve – what would it be? What What do you want to do next year? And she thought, and she couldn't think, and she couldn't couldn't, couldn't come up with that. I had to really prompt us to be able to think differently because she'd never been asked the question before. And we finally, about 35 minutes after I'd initiated the conversation, we finally got it out of her that her lifelong ambition was she was 29 years old and she couldn't drive. Oh. Um, her husband drove her everywhere and didn't endorse her having driving lessons because they were a one-car family and they didn't think they could afford a second car. <laughs> and he didn't want to give up his independence of owning his own vehicle. So he just drove her wherever she needed to be. Um, and I said, well, well how, about if, how about if next year, if we hit all of our targets, why don't I teach you how to drive? Why don't I pay for you to have driving lessons and to learn how to drive? Well, why would you do that for me? I says, because it's something you've told me you'd really like to do. Well, well, why don't we make that possible? I says, I'll tell you what we'll do. I said, well, on a Monday morning, we'll get the driving instructor to pick you up from home at half past eight in the morning. And you can have a driving lesson and you can come into work at half past nine instead of nine o'clock. And I'll pay for the driving lesson. I'll tell you what. I says, if you pass your test... And if we hit our extended targets, I might look to being able to get you a car um, and put you on. It'll have to be a pool car. It won't be yours per se, but we might look to be able to put a pool car available to you so you could actually drive yourself to work and back. Now, that might have cost me two or 300 quid for the driving lessons and maybe 100, maybe 150 quid a month for the car as, as some lease option. The buy-in I got from that girl for the four years that she worked for me, I could have bought her a car with what she achieved in able to show gratitude for what we did for her. Right. Because it was way beyond the cash. We gave her independence. We gave her purpose. But then that's um, another point about what you're saying with your team, team dynamics. It's investing in them in the right way, which is suitable to them and not to the company. Because if you're investing in them personally and what they're personally trying to achieve over and above what is good for the company, then obviously they're going to repay back by working that extra harder because now suddenly if you're interested in them, they're now going to be interested in what they're doing. Yes, absolutely. Um, right. I've got, I've got, currently I've got three people working for me within this business in my sales team role. Um, they've all got their own targets. They all tie into what we need as a business to be able to achieve, but they've all got a different reward mechanism dependent on what's relevant to them. Um, <clears throat> one of them wants cash. Um, one of them is keen to be able to earn as much money as possible. I know he's recently got engaged and he's looking to be able to marry next year and there's 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 a big expense coming up um and he wants to earn as much as possible so all of his targets are based around being able to him to earn as much as he can possibly earn and to demonstrate a structure as to if this is what you bring in this is what we'll give out um and it's endless We, we don't cap anything that we do in this business we make sure that if that's what you're after then we'll give it to you as much as you possibly can and he will come in at seven or eight o'clock of an evening. He will come in on a Saturday. He will give up Sunday morning for two or three hours if he's got nothing else on to be able to come in because he's got a target and he knows that he's going to be able to make that money. 
I've got another member of the team who's aiming to be able to achieve the same types of things for our business, mm -hmm. but wants time off. Um, he's recently become a father, um, and he wants to be able to spend time with his girlfriend and his, and his new son. Oh. Um, so we need to be able to set him some far more tangible benefits of saying, well, if you achieve this by X, then you can have the rest of the week off to go and be with your family. Yeah. Um, so he works extra a lot more astute than the guy who just wants cash because he wants to be able to be far more conscious of his time management in order to try and hit the right targets because as soon as he's hit his target, he's out the door. Right. You remind me of somebody I used to know who worked, um, he was supposed to work X amount of weeks in a month, but he was given a task to do of programming. And as long as he'd written his part of the program, that was it. He didn't need to do any more for that month. So you, he used to actually sit down for three days solid uh, with very little sleep, very little anything else. And he just programmed. And he'd say he would complete that, turn it around and send it back. And that was it. The rest of the month was actually off. It was his. He could do what he liked with it then. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's about understanding the people that we are investing in and right. seeing them as an investment. So do you have any handy tips, tools, tricks, psychometric testing, ways on how we can understand the people that we're working with so we can actually get that back up? Or is it just building that relationship and grunt work, really, of taking the time to know people? There's a load of stuff out there with regards to psychometric testing and team dynamics. Um, I, I follow somebody called Rebecca Stevens who runs a business called Work Brighter. Um, she's a business psychologist that specialises in um, positive workflow. Um, um, she's got a fabulous free to sign up newsletter, which is brilliant. Um, and again, th there are loads of different tools out there, depending on the industry you're in, depending on the targets that you've got in house, how how aggressive you are at being able to try and achieve those types of targets. Um, sometimes down to the time of year it is with regards to understanding other things that are happening around us. You know, we, we're just entering silly season, as I call it, with regards to the run-up to Christmas. Um, and people's own dynamics change um, with regards to whether it's a push to be able to get the Christmas shopping done or a push to be able to get that last bonus in before a Christmas paycheck. So it there's a whole stuff out there that, that can help people understand as to what they need to be able to do differently. The simple answer is, is if you're unhappy with the effects that, of the team that you're getting at present, you've got to start by looking internally. You've got to start by looking at you and saying who took on the team and why are they performing in the way that they are currently performing? How do I want them to perform? And what do I need to do differently in order to facilitate a different outcome from my team. It's being aware about themselves then. It's got to come from within first. If you want something different, you've got to be willing to do something different. And sometimes it could be, you know, we're, we're entering, yes, silly season, but we're coming to the end of 2015. It would be really interesting to be able to have a very clear mission statement about what we're going to achieve next year and then communicate that to the team just before Christmas, be willing to invite 360 degree feedback to be able to get some proper engagement from our team to understand as to what it is that they want, to look for the resistance, to be willing to face it head on in order to create a different year and a different outcome next year. But anything's possible. You've just got to have the strength and determinations to make it so. Okay. And your suggestions as well? for the different team building can i just ask do they work for all types of teams throughout the company as in like the accounts team sales team marketing team the one team for the business or is there sort of like different team dynamics for different departments to an overall company i remember going to work with audi a couple of years ago um and I got there and I was shocked to learn that they'd separated everybody into different areas uh, and marketing were going to do their thing and sales were going to do their thing um, and admin were going to do HR, we're going to do team ons to tag ons to training, I think it was, and do their own thing. Um, and yet the whole day was themed as cohesion. Um, and, I couldn't, and I couldn't understand as to how that was going to be so. Um, you have got to have one statement 
that is relevant to every single player in the in, in the in the team and in order to be able to do so take away strip back all of the the rules and red tape and bureaucracy within your own business and be willing to say what is the minimum that i need to achieve in order to get from a to b let's cut back all of the rubbish that we've created with regards to this self grandioso thing of title or deed or responsibility and say let's put everyone in the room let's communicate the mission statement and what it means to them in order if we achieve it and then get some buy in and listens to what people have got to say because ironically if you give people a voice if you give people an opportunity to say what have i got to give to this process you'd be amazed at some of the people in your team that are capable of so much more than you give them credit for because you've given them a title and a responsibility recognition absolutely it's probably the biggest thing on anyone's list is that i want to be recognized for who i am i want to be i want to be seen for what i do to communicate and and contribute sometimes as much as a sincere thank you could be bigger than a 500 pound or 500 dollar bonus because if it's not the cash that's the incentive it's just a palm off as opposed to the public recognition or the personal recognition of what you've done and how that's helped everybody else is often enough okay ironically some of the things we did in the trenches were simply a pat on the back and but it speaks volumes massively massively for my commanding officer at christmas to be able to turn around and say good morning jay as he walked past knowing me and yet we were 817 other people wearing the same uniform but to be able to recognize me as an individual was sufficient to volunteer to go to battle with him and if we can't use that as an example then surely we're missing a trick absolutely absolutely so to sum up then we're talking about time team dynamics and must class what would be your summation or the biggest thing that i would need to do to get the right team in the right place and then take it to the next level okay in a nutshell it's quite simply attitude the attitude of the business owner the attitude of the people within the business strip away job descriptions strip away roles and responsibilities hire on attitude and get them to sign up to a code of behavior that we all are measured by be willing to have 360 degree feedback and invite people at any time at any position in the business to turn around and say what are you doing right now and how is that contributing to our mission and be willing to understand that some of the people on our team now aren't the ones which will get us to where we need to be it's about being able to it's being willing to educate them to be able to flee the nest because ironically it creates the positions of the next good thing that's going to come to us look to the future look at who is out there already hire from the very top of the pool go to the 1% in your industry that are doing phenomenally well that you want to part of look at their top two or three players and find out if they're happy have a conversation with them talk to them about are you bored because i wasn't my first business i got to a level where i became complacent and it might be that somebody else is looking for a new challenge mm-hmm. keep your eyes open keep your ears open keep your feet on the ground <laughs> that last point being really really pertinent as well okay well thank you very much for your time today i'd love to sort of like carry on and do a little bit more because i know you have a whole load of other things to um give some more information to give as well so would you be open to doing a second one i'd be delighted to thanks very much for the invitation excellent thank you and thank you for your time